This videotape examines vertical temperature and moisture profiles obtained from satellite radiance measurements. The tape is organized into five sections. An overview of current meteorological satellites, a summary of the physical processes which affect Earth radiation to space, examples of a method of solution used in transforming radiance measurements to meteorological data, a discussion of the characteristics of satellite-derived information, and finally, two studies of weather situations demonstrating the use of satellite-derived information. The first image displays a temperature and moisture profile obtained from radio sound information, the second from satellite radiance measurements. The profiles are created on a skew T log P diagram. Isotherms run diagonally toward the upper right. Isentropes run diagonally toward the upper left with dashed saturated mixing ratio contours asymptotic to the isentropes. The temperature profile is shown by the solid line, the dew point by the dashed line. Sounding winds are indicated along the right-hand margin. Prominent features of the radio sound profile include temperature inversions near the surface and 800 millibars, and a saturated layer from the surface to 850 millibars with drying above. The tropopause is located near 250 millibars. There's little change in the wind direction with height, although wind speed does increase aloft. By comparison, a satellite-produced profile is smoother. Although the vertical resolution of the radio sound is greater, the synoptic scale atmospheric structure is captured by the satellite-derived profile. The following sequences depict the space and time availability of satellite data as compared with radio sounds. The density of the global network of radio sound stations varies a great deal, with very little information received from the vast ocean areas. Additionally, large regions of some land masses do not provide much data. These data points locate radio sound stations in the southeastern United States. The stations are about 500 kilometers apart. This data density usually provides adequate coverage for determining synoptic scale atmospheric structure. However, very few areas of the Earth have a radio sound network this dense. The next image shows satellite derived data four hours later than the radio sounds shown previously. The density of the satellite data is greater than the radio sounds in many areas. However, Portions of the satellite field of view obscured by cloud cover do not yield complete profiles. Examining the temporal scale, the next sequence shows the morning radio sound reports, daytime satellite data, and the evening radio sounds. While radio sound information is available globally at only two instances during a 24-hour period, geostationary satellite data is available every 30 minutes providing a significant improvement in temporal resolution. This information can be especially helpful during the severe weather season in the United States, since late afternoon thunderstorm development typically occurs long after the 1200 GMT radio sound launch. The final sequence of this segment illustrates the data gap over the oceans. The first image shows radio sound locations which provide upper air information for the western Atlantic. Next, geostationary satellite sounding data is added. The lack of conventional data over the oceans demonstrates the need for satellite data, which can provide a more homogeneous global data network. This segment of the videotape discusses technical information concerning meteorological satellites and their orbital characteristics. The satellite pictured here is GOES-5, currently orbiting about 36,000 kilometers above the Earth. The GOES-5 satellite is in a geosynchronous orbit with the Earth, remaining above the equator at the same longitude, in this case, 75 degrees west. GOES satellites carry instrumentation to provide visible and infrared images of the full Earth disk. The most recent GOES also carry a sounding instrument which measures radiance in 12 different infrared channels, providing data for the construction of vertical atmospheric profiles. GOES East scans North and South America and significant portions of the adjacent oceans. The coastlines of southern Europe and northern Africa are on the far right of the image. 
The curvature of the Earth's surface prohibits data acquisition from regions greater than 60 degrees from the sub-satellite point. Goes West, located above 135 degrees west longitude, scans most of the Pacific Ocean. The east coast of Australia lies in the lower left corner. Note that there is some overlap of the satellite images over the central United States. The polar orbiting NOAA satellites also provide a meteorological sounding platform. Satellites of this type have pioneered the development of instruments and research in producing accurate meteorological data from radiance measurements. In addition to the infrared TOVS instrument, a microwave sounding unit can provide information in cloud-covered regions. NOAA satellites orbit the Earth about 850 kilometers above the surface with a period of 110 minutes. Thus, polar orbiting satellites generally make a pass over a given region every 12 hours. An example from a descending pass over the eastern United States depicts the resolution and coverage achieved with the infrared soundings. There are 56 fields of view across the swath, contiguous along the satellite track. The gaps in the sounding data are due to instrument calibration. Orbital passes may be put together to form a mosaic of information although the time scale is distorted. The larger circles being drawn over the orbital passes depict the resolution of the microwave measurements. The lower resolution of the microwave sounding unit is due to the relatively small amount of radiation in this portion of the spectrum. This presently limits the use of microwave sounders to polar orbiting satellites. This portion of the videotape investigates the radiation physics which provide a theoretical basis for remote atmospheric soundings. The radiative flux from a body at a particular wavelength is dependent on its radiative temperature. Warm bodies emit most of their radiation at short wavelengths, while cooler bodies have a maximum of emission at longer wavelengths. Thus, the sun emits most of its radiation at the relatively short visible wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, near 0.5 microns, while terrestrial radiation from the Earth has an emission maximum near 11 microns in the infrared. The Planck function describes the spectral distribution of electromagnetic radiation for a black body at a given temperature. The shape of the function is similar for all radiating bodies, but warmer radiative temperatures displace the maximum toward shorter wavelengths, while colder temperatures shift the maximum toward longer wavelengths. The graph depicts the radiation curve for the Earth, whose effective radiative temperature is near 255 degrees Kelvin. Most radiation occurs between 5 and 15 microns with the maximum around 11 microns. Atmospheric constituents can have significant effects on the radiation beam. Terrestrial radiation incident upon the atmosphere is either absorbed, reflected, or transmitted by molecules of a particular atmospheric constituent. The absorbed radiation is re-emitted isotropically by the absorbing body in accordance with the Planck function. Reflected radiation is scattered non-isotropically. Since all radiation is either absorbed, reflected, or transmitted, the sum of the energy processes satisfies the conservation of energy principle. The major atmospheric absorbers of terrestrial radiation are water vapor, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. These constituents are utilized in satellite soundings of the atmospheric state at wavelengths appropriate to each constituent. The amount of water vapor and carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere is very small, but they absorb radiation near the region of maximum emission. Almost all water vapor is found in the lowest five kilometers of the atmosphere, while carbon dioxide is more homogeneously mixed in the troposphere. Small fluctuations in the amount of these gases can result in significant changes in weather and climate. oxygen absorption bands are located in the microwave region of the spectrum. However, as the Planck function indicates, very little radiation is emitted by the Earth in this spectral region, resulting in a weak signal. 
As noted earlier, most terrestrial radiation occurs in the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum, between 4 and 20 microns. The strength of the signal and the presence of strong absorption bands in this region make it the ideal location for sensing radiation. The graphic illustrates that between 5 and 8 microns, water vapor absorbs a major portion of the outgoing radiation. Carbon dioxide absorbs most radiation between 12 and 18 microns. These water vapor and carbon dioxide absorption bands are utilized by satellite sensors to provide information on the horizontal and vertical structure of the atmosphere. An absorption band due to ozone is located near 9 microns. This absorption occurs mainly in the stratosphere. Recall that the wavelength of maximum emission for terrestrial radiation is located near 11 microns, which corresponds to a region of very little atmospheric absorption. Combining the theoretical radiance values of the Planck function with the absorption qualities of the atmosphere results in the distribution of observed radiation to space. The smooth curve is the spectral distribution of radiation for a black body given by the Planck function. The other curve is the observed radiation to space over this spectral interval. Where the observed radiation curve meets the Planck function curve, the atmospheric transmissivity is equal to 1, referred to as a window region. In regions with less observed radiation than the Planck function curve, radiation is absorbed by the atmospheric constituent indicated. The 9 to 11 micron window region is interrupted by an ozone absorption band. Carbon dioxide is a strong absorber in the 15 micron region, while water vapor absorbs radiation near 7 microns and near 16 microns. A closer look at the 15 micron region of the spectrum provides more detail about its absorption characteristics. The graph indicates the effective radiative temperature for a given wavelength, although the ordinate is also proportional to energy emitted at that wavelength. The spike near 15 microns represents the large amount of radiation absorbed at the center of the band and re-emitted to space from the top of the atmosphere, where the temperature is relatively warm. Moving away from the center of the band towards the wings or band edges, the amount of radiation absorbed decreases. Measurements in the wings represent radiation emitted from lower in the atmosphere. The colder radiative temperatures from near the tropopause and the warmer radiative temperatures from the lower troposphere. Near the edges of the band, the atmosphere is almost completely transparent, allowing radiation from the warmer, lower troposphere to escape directly to space. Regions of change in the absorption characteristics with wavelength provide an ideal location to measure radiance. Satellite sensors measure radiation emitted from a very narrow wavelength interval in regions of the spectrum such as the 15 micron band. Measuring radiation from several narrow intervals within a band provides information about the radiative temperature at different levels of the atmosphere. The integral form of the radiative transfer equation used to solve for a vertical profile of the atmosphere is approximated using a summation of numerous thin atmospheric layers. Thus, the total radiance received at the satellite is made up of contributions from the surface and various atmospheric layers. The NOAA-6 and 7 polar orbiting satellite sounders have seven infrared channels in the 15 micron region of the spectrum, which are used to construct vertical temperature profiles. This section will show what part of the atmosphere is sensed by each channel. Channel 1, located at the center of the absorption band, senses radiation to space from the layer near the top of the atmosphere. The response function usually referred to as the weighting function, peaks between 10 and 20 millibars in the relatively warm upper stratosphere. Note that the level of peak contribution varies from channel to channel. Channel 2, located at 14.7 microns, senses radiation from the colder lower stratosphere. 
The associated weighting function peaks near 60 millibars. Note the overlap of the instrument channel weighting functions. This overlap compensates in part for the broadness of the individual weighting functions. Channel 3 at 14.5 microns is slightly farther down the wing of the absorption band. This measurement corresponds to the approximate location of the tropopause. The weighting function associated with channel 3 peaks near 100 millibars. Moving still lower in the atmosphere, channel 4, located at 14.2 microns, has a warmer radiative temperature. Although this channel has a weighting function peak around 400 millibars, there is a contribution throughout a great depth of the atmosphere. A radiative contribution from thick layers of the atmosphere limits the vertical resolution of satellite soundings. The channels in the lower troposphere are located on the edges of the absorption band. Less absorption occurs in this region, allowing more radiation to escape directly to space. Channel 5, at 14 microns, has a weighting function peak at 600 millibars. Radiation from channel 6, centered at 13.7 microns, has a weighting function peak near 800 millibars. Notice that the middle troposphere has good coverage from channels 4, 5, and 6. The radiative contribution for a given level of the atmosphere is often made up of contributions from a number of channels. Most radiation measured by channel 7, centered at 13.4 microns, escapes directly to space. The weighting function peaks near 900 millibars. Finally, by utilizing radiance measurements from window channels, information is obtained about the surface skin temperature. This section will examine selected channels of the VAS instrument on board recent GO satellites and the TOVS microwave instrument on board the NOAA satellites. VAS stands for Visor Atmospheric Sounder. Visor is the instrument type, a visible infrared spin scan radiometer. TOVS stands for Tyros Orbiting Vertical Sounder. Examining data from individual channels of the sounding instrument provides a great deal of information about the temperature and moisture structure of a quasi-horizontal layer of the atmosphere. Each element in the image depicts a radiance value or brightness temperature. Channel 2 of the VAS instrument has a weighting function peak near 70 millibars in the mid to lower stratosphere. The image indicates the lack of significant thermal gradients at this level. Slightly cooler temperatures, the lighter shading, lie to the south, while warmer temperatures, the darker shading, are found to the north. A color enhancement of the brightness values does not provide additional information at this level. The weighting function peak of channel 4 is located in the mid-troposphere although there is a contribution from a deep layer of the atmosphere. In addition to thermal gradients, tropospheric channels may also indicate the presence of clouds. Since most infrared radiation is absorbed by clouds, the instrument senses radiance mainly from the cloud top to the top of the atmosphere, hence a cold brightness temperature. Color enhancement of this image provides a sharp distinction between clear and cloudy conditions in the mid-troposphere. The channel 6 weighting function peaks in the lower troposphere. At this level, temperature contrasts in clear sky regions can be distinguished. Also, the presence of clouds at different heights are apparent. Although grayscale images indicate some contrast, a much more detailed image is obtained by color coding the brightness temperatures. The brightest or whitest regions indicate the coldest or highest cloud tops. Red, the next coldest color, indicates somewhat lower clouds, while the green areas indicate either the lowest clouds or cool, clear sky temperatures. Blue is the next warmer color, and black indicates the warmest clear sky regions at this level. Clouds can be differentiated from clear skies by looking at different channels or by looping images from one channel through time. Next, two window or surface channels will be displayed. 
channel 8 is located at 11.2 microns and channel 12 at 3.9 microns. Channel 8 vividly indicates the temperature contrasts at this wavelength. A band of high cloud tops stretches from eastern Texas northeastward to Indiana. Higher tops indicate probable thunderstorms in the northern and eastern Gulf of Mexico. The red and green areas in eastern Texas are mid and low clouds associated with the cold front. Also note the thin cirrus streak in this region, indicated by the white enhancement. The blue shading over central Texas and Oklahoma is associated with clear skies and warmer radiative temperatures. Channel 12 is located in the near infrared. Because of its close proximity to the solar radiation maximum, this channel can be contaminated by reflected shortwave radiation. Notice much of the color enhanced image is warmer than channel 8. The clouds from Texas to Indiana are more red than white. Much of the region of brightness temperatures color enhanced green in channel 8 are a warmer blue in channel 12. Examining the two window channels once again, notice the region from eastern to central Texas. The area of low clouds in eastern Texas, enhanced green, has a lower radiative temperature than the clear skies and warmer blue enhancement in central Texas. By contrast, channel 12 indicates warmer temperatures in eastern Texas than in the central part of the state. This is due to the reflected shortwave contribution from the low clouds in eastern Texas. The Vaz Channel 10 senses radiation in the 6.7 micron water vapor absorption band and has a weighting function peak in the mid to upper troposphere. The dark regions indicate dry air, while progressively lighter grayscale shades indicate greater moisture for this layer. The enhanced image shows an extensive dry wedge colored blue from Texas to Missouri, while the most abundant moisture is associated with the convection in the Gulf of Mexico and Mississippi. The weighting function peaks of channels 4 and 10 are both near 400 millibars. However, the information they contain is very different. Channel 4 indicates the thermal structure, while channel 10 measures mid-tropospheric moisture. Both images are brightest in cloudy regions. Looping through this sample of Vaz channels summarizes the characteristics of each channel. The stratospheric channel indicates the reversal of the thermal field from the lower troposphere. The mid-tropospheric channel shows signs of higher clouds. The lower tropospheric channel provides information on cloud heights and clear sky temperatures. The surface window, channel 8, shows cloud regions and, when used with other window channels, provides surface skin temperature data. Finally, the water vapor channel depicts upper tropospheric moisture. The other Vaz channels provide similar data. The combined effect of all 12 channels provides vertical and quasi-horizontal temperature and moisture information over the viewing area. A microwave sounding unit is part of the instrument package on polar orbiting satellites. Since microwave radiation suffers little attenuation from water vapor or small water droplets, these channels can sense radiation through clouds. However, microwave channels are somewhat attenuated by larger precipitation size droplets. Microwave channel 2 has a mid to lower tropospheric weighting function peak. This sample is taken from an orbit close to the time of the previous Vaz imagery. The color enhancement indicates a cold trough in the mid-troposphere. The coldest brightness temperatures are associated with the white color, warming again from red to green, blue, and black. There is seemingly little effect from the clouds in this image. Note the strong thermal gradient present over eastern Texas. In Colorado and Wyoming, the peaks of the Rocky Mountains are colder than the surrounding air. 
Microwave channel 4 has a waiting function peak in the stratosphere. In the lower stratosphere, the temperature structure of the atmosphere is reversed from that of the troposphere because of the low polar tropopause and the relatively high tropical tropopause. This image illustrates this phenomena with the colder, whiter region to the south and the warmer red and green regions to the north. This section of the video cassette deals with solutions for temperature and moisture profiles as derived from the radiative transfer equation. Methods of transforming satellite radiance measurements into meteorological data have used two distinct approaches. One method uses radiative transfer physics and obtains a direct solution. However, due to the nature of the equation, the solutions are not unique. Iterative techniques have been the most successful direct solution methods. A second method of solution uses statistics to derive vertical profiles from radiance measurements. Methods of this type make use of large quantities of data compiled from other sources and obtain a best fit solution to the data. In the following examples, a general iterative direct method of solution is used to obtain vertical profiles of temperature and moisture. The iterative method begins with a first guess profile to initialize the retrieval process. The guess field may be model output, such as LFM or hemispheric data, or it may be climatological in nature. Surface reports can be combined with the above guess field. The examples shown are from March 6, 1982. The VAS 11-micron window depicts a strong temperature gradient associated with a cold front in eastern Texas. A special radio sound network operating on this day provides comparison with the satellite data. The identification numbers indicate where satellite retrievals were made near radio sound launch sites while the cursor shows the location of the profiles that are examined. These VAS retrievals show how lower tropospheric detail can be improved by including surface reports. Without surface data, the profile is extended down towards the surface from the lowest atmospheric data point, about 850 millibars. Next, the effect of the first guess is considered. Satellite profiles calculated using LFM and climatology first guess fields are compared to a nearby radiosan. The radiosan data shows an isothermal layer in the lower troposphere, a very unstable lapse rate in the mid troposphere, and the tropopause near 400 millibars. The moisture profile is rather dry. The VAS profile using a climatology first guess field is slightly cooler in the lower troposphere. Since this air mass is unseasonably cool, the climatology first guess starts the algorithm too warm. However, the profiling algorithm iterates until it reaches an acceptable solution, which is very similar to the radio sound. The VAS profile using an LFM first guess field is slightly warmer in the lower troposphere and cooler in the upper troposphere than the VAS profile using a climatology first guess field. The small differences between the two profiles indicates the adjustments the profiling algorithm can make to the first guess field. Over the continental United States, the LFM first guess is usually preferred. In this particular case, the climatology and LFM first guess fields yield similar profiles in the lower troposphere, with the maximum temperature differences on the order of 2 to 3 degrees Celsius near 300 millibars. The next pair of profiles considered are located near the clouds associated with the cold front. Recall that it is difficult to obtain satellite profiles in these situations. If too many fields of view are cloud contaminated, the algorithm will not produce a complete profile. In this case, retrievals from both the polar orbiter, which includes the microwave, and the GOES are compared. The radiosan profile is very moist from the surface to 400 millibars. A stable layer is present near the surface and a near dry adiabatic lapse rate in the upper troposphere. The profile obtained from the polar orbiting vertical sounder depicts a structure very similar to the radiosan. 
The profile from the Vaz sounder also is in close agreement. Considering the difference in satellite location and movement, this result indicates the precision of the instrument radiance measurements. Comparing the radio sound profile with the satellite-derived profiles shows the distinct similarities between them. All soundings exhibit an isothermal lower troposphere, weaker stability in the mid-troposphere, and greater stability in the upper troposphere. Tropopause heights are also in close agreement. The moisture profiles from all three sources indicate nearly saturated conditions from the surface to the upper troposphere. The last series of profiles examines the sensitivity of the satellite retrieval algorithm to differences in brightness temperatures. The first profile is located in the cold, stable air behind the cold front. The computer algorithm was altered to artificially increase the brightness temperature of channel 4 by 2 degrees. Recall that channel 4 has a weighting function peak near 400 millibars. The result is a distinctly different profile. The increased channel 4 brightness temperature warms the profile from 200 to 650 millibars. However, due to the overlap of the weighting functions, the atmosphere above and below this warmer region becomes cooler. Increasing the channel 4 brightness temperature by 4 degrees magnifies these effects to the point of rendering the profile unrealistic. In the vicinity of the weighting function peak, the new profile temperature differs from the original solution by 10 degrees Celsius. Thus, small changes in brightness temperature measurements can have a very large effect upon the structure of the profile. Finally, two separate satellite retrievals, approximately 200 kilometers apart, are compared to show the relationship between brightness temperature and the final profile structure. Brightness temperature differences of 2 degrees can produce profile temperature differences of 5 degrees. The sounding with the higher brightness temperatures is warmer through much of the atmosphere. The next portion of the video cassette investigates the use of satellite radiance measurements as a forecast tool for severe weather situations. A synoptic scale disturbance in the southeastern United States on April 26, 1982 is examined. The first sequences are goes east visible and infrared images shown every three hours. The early morning visible image indicates a small line of cumulonimbus clouds in northwestern Alabama. During the day, thunderstorms developed in the warm sector of the cyclone and along the cold or dry front. Ten tornadoes were reported during the afternoon hours, one each in Tennessee and Mississippi, two in Georgia, and six in Alabama. The cyclonic circulation of the comma-shaped cloud is evident in the sequence of infrared imagery. Cumulonimbus formation is evident by local noon in Mississippi, becoming very widespread during the afternoon. Radar reports indicate cloud tops in excess of 50,000 feet. Next, the 11 micron window channel and the 6.7 micron water vapor channel are examined over six time periods from 15 to 21 Z. The window channel sequence indicates the circulation center of the cyclone moves from northeastern Arkansas to western Tennessee during the afternoon. Thunderstorms develop in a cloud-free region to the south and east of this center. The water vapor channel indicates a mid-tropospheric dry wedge extending from the Gulf of Mexico to North Carolina. A second, smaller dry intrusion extends northward through Mississippi. Intense convection develops within this intrusion as it moves through Alabama. Combining and color enhancing the infrared window and water vapor data provides a sequence of images depicting clouds and mid-tropospheric moisture. The images indicate a pre-thunderstorm environment in Alabama of clear skies and dry mid-tropospheric air. These factors, together with surface temperatures greater than 20 degrees Celsius and surface dew points in excess of 15 degrees Celsius, contribute to the destabilization of the atmosphere in this region. 
Vaz radiance data are used to investigate factors contributing to atmospheric destabilization. The four sounding periods listed are sequenced to investigate the evolution of the thunderstorm environment in terms of the commonly used total totals stability index. The totals index utilizes low-level temperature and moisture and mid-level temperature data to provide an estimate of the convective instability of the atmosphere. The following sequences display satellite-derived quantities of these parameters. In the mid-troposphere, colder temperatures favor a more unstable lapse rate. The 16Z image with superimposed 500 millibar satellite-derived isotherms depicts a cold trough extending from Illinois to western Alabama. Recall that the image of mid-tropospheric moisture indicates dry air in the mid-troposphere with this relatively cold air. Slightly colder temperatures are indicated over Alabama by 1730Z. Note the isotherm contour interval is 1 degree Celsius. It should be emphasized that the accuracy of all measurements and the use of computer interpolation and contouring schemes can result in errors larger than the interval displayed here. Users of the data must look for consistency in the fields. The 1930Z image indicates rapid convective development within the region of coldest 500 millibar temperatures. Continuing through the 2030Z image, coldest 500 millibar temperatures remain in the region of thunderstorm development. The totals index uses 850 millibar temperature and moisture data to provide an estimate of the lower tropospheric structure. Relatively warm temperatures at this level result in greater instability. A large temperature gradient at 850 millibars over the eastern United States is depicted by the 16Z Vaz data. A cold trough is located over Arkansas, while a ridge of warmer air lies over the southeastern United States. The next three Vaz sounding periods also indicate the strong temperature gradient at this level. The location and movement of gradients are a more reliable form of satellite data than the use of absolute values. The warm air ridge is maintained over Alabama during the afternoon while the cold air slides eastward, strengthening the temperature gradient. Thunderstorms develop within the region of warmest 850 millibar temperatures. In considering the low-level moisture contributing to the totals index, it is instructive to look at the total precipitable water. Satellite-derived layer quantities, such as precipitable water, are more accurately measured than moisture values at a specific pressure level. Since most moisture is located in the lower atmosphere, this parameter provides a good estimate of the moisture available for convection. The vase-derived precipitable water superimposed over the water vapor imagery indicates the most abundant low-level moisture is located over Alabama. The contours are in millimeters of liquid water. By 1930Z, a well-defined low-level moisture maximum is located over central Alabama. Note that the water vapor image indicates dry air in the mid-troposphere over this region. The final image again shows the low-level moisture maxima in the region of intense thunderstorm development. The temperature and moisture fields depicted have shown consistency throughout the daytime hours. Values of the totals index calculated from the vase temperature and moisture data displayed in the previous sequences are examined next. Largest values of the totals index indicating greatest instability are located over a large area of the southeast in the 16Z image. By 1730Z, the largest index values are centered over Alabama. The index maximum remains over Alabama during the afternoon, in the same region where many severe weather occurrences were reported. The continuous stream of satellite-derived data allows a constant monitoring of the atmosphere and its evolution. 
The same evolution can be seen in a series of vertical temperature and moisture profiles from the vicinity of Centerville, Alabama. The morning radio sound is followed by Vaz profiles for the four sounding times previously examined. The satellite soundings are made in cloud-free regions near Centerville. The radio sound profile indicates a temperature inversion near the surface with saturated conditions to 800 millibars. Further aloft, the temperature profile is nearly moist adiabatic with rapid drying. The 16Z Vaz profile also shows a stable layer near the surface with a moist adiabatic lapse rate above 850 millibars. The moisture profile is less detailed. The totals index is 57. By 1730Z, the low-level stable layer is being eroded away by surface heating and mixing. The moisture profile suggests nearly saturated conditions near 850 millibars. The totals index is 63. At 1930Z, the profile is even more unstable. The lapse rate is almost dry adiabatic between 850 and 700 millibars. Moisture is still indicated in the lower troposphere. The totals index has reached 67. At this time, thunderstorms were in the vicinity of Centerville. The 2030Z sounding is further west than the first three Vaz soundings due to cloud cover in the area. By 2030Z, thunderstorms have moved through the region and the upper tropospheric lapse rate is less steep. Note the upper tropospheric winds have turned to the northwest. The totals index remains high at 65. Time sequencing the Vaz profiles depicts the destabilization of the atmosphere during the daytime hours. The morning surface inversion weakens while the mid tropospheric lapse rate steepens. More stable air appears in the upper troposphere at the end of the sequence as the wind veers to the northwest. Perhaps the most significant contribution from satellite radiance measurements is over the vast ocean areas where very little data is available from other sources. These sequences of Hurricane Debbie provide examples depicting the use of satellite data. The first data set displays Vaz measurements from 21Z on September 15, 1982. The center of Hurricane Debbie is near 30 degrees north latitude and 68 degrees west longitude, about 1,300 kilometers east of the U.S. coastline. Color enhancement of the 11 micron window channel indicates a ring of intense convection depicted by the white area around the eye of the storm. Clouds stretch to the northeast associated with a mid-latitude trough. The mid-tropospheric water vapor channel shows a broad area of moisture to the northeast associated with the trough and to the east and southeast associated with the hurricane circulation. Drier air is present west of the hurricane. To the south, a portion of the dry air is entering the hurricane circulation. A closer look at the hurricane is obtained by magnifying these images. This technique does not produce a higher resolution image, but can provide greater detail. The 11 micron window channel depicts a well-defined eye within the hurricane. Color enhancement indicates a band of convective clouds to the southeast of the storm and cirrus outflow to the northeast. The highest cloud tops comprise the eye wall of the hurricane. The brightest areas in the water vapor image associated with relatively large amounts of mid-tropospheric moisture are probably regions of more intense thunderstorm activity. The band of thunderstorms southeast of the eye wall lies along the dry air boundary. At this time, Hurricane Debbie was far from a major landmass. The 250 millibar geopotential height data from the closest radio sound stations is shown in the first image. Bermuda is located to the northeast of the storm center. The huge data void region in the western Atlantic is very evident. Next, geopotential heights from the 21Z Vaz retrieval are added. Retrievals can be generated from clear and partly cloudy regions. However, a data gap still exists in areas of dense cloud cover. 
Two hundred and fifty millibar contoured heights indicate an upper tropospheric trough over the hurricane. Notice the computer has contoured heights in regions where there were no VAS retrievals. Over the cloud-covered area, a first guess field was used where sounding information was not available. At 21Z on the 15th, Hurricane Debbie had an estimated central pressure of 968 millibars, with maximum winds near 50 meters per second. A mid-latitude trough was causing the hurricane to recurve to the northeast at a forward speed of 5 meters per second. Again, the VAS data provides almost all available data covering the hurricane environment. Note the eastern U.S. 850 millibar radio sound heights are in close agreement with the satellite-derived heights. 850 millibar isohipses indicate a broad region of lower heights associated with the hurricane. Gradient winds can be calculated at each grid point. The radio sound wind at Bermuda is in agreement with the expected circulation. The National Hurricane Research Laboratory conducted a drop sound experiment in the environment around Debbie on the 15th of September. In the following sequence, several of the resulting drop sound profiles are compared to nearby VAS profiles. These 850 millibar temperatures mark the location of the individual dropsons. The cursor indicates the vicinity of the VAS and dropson profiles to be examined. This VAS profile indicates a stable lower troposphere west of the hurricane. The termination of the moisture profile at 700 millibars represents very rapid drying above this level. Superimposing the drops on profile displays the close agreement between the temperature and moisture data for the two profiles. The second pair of profiles is located just south of the mid-tropospheric dry wedge depicted in this water vapor image. This vase profile depicts a warm, relatively stable lower troposphere. Low clouds are suggested by the saturated moisture profile in the lower troposphere. The drops on profile is again in close agreement. The final pair of profiles is located to the south of the hurricane. The VAS profile suggests near saturated conditions in the very warm lower troposphere. The drops on profile is somewhat more unstable with greater lower level moisture. The next sequence of images are from early the next morning, 12Z on the 16th of September. This data was obtained from the NOAA-6 polar orbiting satellite. The first image, an 11 micron window channel, shows Hurricane Debbie east of the Carolinas. The black enhancement indicates clear skies and the warm waters of the Gulf Stream. Just north of the instrument calibration band, the brightest enhancement depicts the highest or coldest cloud tops. The arrow points to a warm pixel, the relatively warm eye region of Hurricane Debbie. The microwave sounding unit on board polar orbiting satellites has become a very useful tool for studying hurricanes. The oxygen absorption band near 50 gigahertz is not affected by water vapor or small water droplets allowing microwave radiation to pass through non-precipitating clouds. The weighting function peaks for the three tropospheric channels are located at 250 and 600 millibars and at the surface. Radiance measurements from the surface microwave channel are highly dependent on the emissivity of the surface. The emissivity of the land in the microwave varies considerably. Notice the surface channel indicates the continent is much colder than the ocean. This is due to the lower emissivity of the land surface. The warmest measurements over the ocean are just south and west of Hurricane Debbie. The mid-tropospheric channel shows the warmest temperatures at this level are again southwest of the hurricane. This channel can be somewhat attenuated by precipitation. The colder brightness temperatures southeast of Bermuda associated with a band of convection are an example. A much different atmospheric structure is indicated by the upper tropospheric microwave channel. The black and blue enhancements depict the upper tropospheric warm core of the tropical cyclone. 
techniques have been developed using this microwave channel, which associate upper tropospheric temperature gradients with hurricane central pressure and maximum wind speed. The final two images show the lower and upper tropospheric thickness fields obtained from microwave radiance measurements. Thickness values are very useful since they cover a vertical layer of the atmosphere, as do instrument channel weighting functions. A trough is present in the lower troposphere, with minimum thickness in the vicinity of Hurricane Debbie. In this image, the contour values over cloudy regions are from microwave radiance measurements, not a first guess field. The upper tropospheric thickness contours depict the warm core anticyclone associated with the hurricane. The classical hurricane structure of low-level cyclonic and upper-level anticyclonic flow is present in Hurricane Debbie. These examples of the use of satellite-derived radiance measurements have shown the contribution of this data to atmospheric science research and forecasting. The data improves upon the spatial and temporal resolution available from other data sources and is both accurate and reliable when properly utilized.